In this chapter, we're going to take a look at the release, control, and validation key principles and how they enable us to manage service transitions, introduce effective new services, and introduce changes in a way that maintains controls and delivers a higher level of quality of service and helps us mitigate and manage incidents. In this lesson, we're going to look at release, control, and validation, its role in the service lifecycle, specific activities that we're going to carry out within release, control, and validation activities, how they work collaboratively together across different process areas to support a working service transition domain, and the broad scope and value to the business associated with release and control and validation processes. The release control and validation cluster includes processes from the service transition service domain as well as service operation stage. And here we're looking at how we effectively maintain appropriate controls of our baselines, plan for and manage changes, introduce new services and releases, and being able to do appropriate validation of our activities as we work our way through service transition in a way that supports effective operation of services. So in this particular chapter, we're going to look at some of the aspects of the service as regards the particular principles of these, how these processes work together to support a whole working transition. Now, when you look at the various processes within the release, control, and validation cluster, it includes a broad array of processes from service transition, including change management, service asset and configuration management, release and deployment, validation and testing, evaluation, and the knowledge management process, as well as the request fulfillment process from service operation, which in many cases may generate requests for change or may actually be used to support standard changes that we pre-approve. So as we start working with each of these process areas, again, it's important to think about how they're going to work together to coordinate and manage change in a way that maintains control, allows us to coordinate release, and provides appropriate confidence through validation activities that we're going to deliver working services into production. Again, if you remember back from your foundations training, when we invest in building processes and services, we're investing what we might call our capabilities and resources in doing that. Resources by and large are stuff, hardware, software, money, people, and so forth. Potential energy we can bring to bear to support a service or a process. And then capabilities are how we then transform those service assets through management, through organization and process, through our knowledge and skills and capabilities and the experience of our people. What we want to be able to do, of course, is to use our service assets in a way that optimizes the benefits that accrue to the customer's service assets so that they can use their capabilities in a way that allows the business to achieve its mission and vision and goals and objectives. So as we start working our way through release control and validation activities, keep in mind that a lot of this, of course, is about managing risk. When we make changes, whether they're new services or changes to existing services, we're doing so for the purpose of creating outcomes for customers, enabling them to better leverage their resources and capabilities to deliver value. And so our job here really is to properly align ours in a way that optimizes theirs. When we look at the release control and validation processes, keep in mind, of course, that we're working largely in support of service transition activities. I want to be able to use a process like change management as my core governance process. How do we make changes to services? How do we assess them? How do we make decisions about risk and cost and impact and decide whether or not we proceed with changes in a certain way? In order to be able to underpin those change management activities, I want to be able to use processes like service asset and configuration management and tooling like a configuration management system to be able to make those impact assessments using good accurate information of my configuration baselines. I want to use processes like release and deployment to oversee how we slot different changes into release windows, oversee how those are validated and tested together to ensure not only the functionality of the change but also the service warranty, operational readiness capabilities, ability to do of management of those changes and so forth, and then to use a process like change evaluation to ensure that we're not just changing hardware and software, but we're actually effectively changing the service in a way that delivers the expected benefits back to the customer. 
Last and certainly not least, we have the process called knowledge management up here. And their job is really to help us establish and maintain a service knowledge management system that provides underpinning information that supports all of these other process activities. How do I make effective decisions based on where I am, what I know, and what information is available to me in the organization? So when you look at release control and validation together, the challenge becomes evident. I have all these processes working generally in parallel. How do we manage coordination and communication across systems, across tools and organizations, across technologies to coordinate service transitions in a way that helps us manage risks, in a way that helps us deliver the benefits of the change to the customer? When we look at the role of release control and validation in service operations, largely it's to deliver effective working services so that service operation can provide appropriate support for them. In this particular case, the process of request fulfillment is included in the RCV cluster, and the reason is because many service requests are routine service changes that effectively have been treated as standard changes pre-approved, and then essentially passed down to the organization as service requests to be managed by request fulfillment. So we really wouldn't be doing the right job of looking at change management governance if we weren't also looking at the process that's going to handle routine change implementations in a way that may ultimately allow us to reduce red tape and deliver those services more effectively and more cost effectively. As we start looking at release control and validation, the challenge is going to become immediately evident. I have lots of things happening at the same time. And so part of this is around coordination activities. Now keep in mind, of course, that even though we're talking about these as if they're really encapsulated as service transition processes, in many cases the work of these various process areas goes well beyond just the service transition stage. So for example, if you look at the very bottom, we have the knowledge management process, and it's consistently provisioning and delivering knowledge and capabilities across the life cycle, and not just here in service transition, but facilitating knowledge transfer for operations, providing a basis for knowledge capture for design and strategy, and so forth. Likewise, continual service improvement activities are going to be ongoing throughout the life cycle and are going to be providing CSI not just in ways that may generate changes for us to manage, but also improvements to all of the various processes we have here. If we look back at service strategy, service strategy is going to be looking at things like change proposals and whether or not those change proposals should be effectively approved based on the large-scale risks and costs and value associated with that change. So the change management process really begins at the very beginning of strategy, even though we may not get specific requests for change until later on as we start doing authorizations against a particular change proposal. Likewise, my service asset and configuration management information is used throughout the life cycle to provide an accurate information basis for decisions. Can we in fact support this service? What kinds of existing capabilities do we have against this? Likewise, we're going to use transition planning and support processes to provide information back to strategy about things like transition risks, resources that would be required, and so forth to be able to transition different services as part of building business cases and strategy. As we work our way through design and ultimately beginning into transition, the role of the service design package, of course, includes a transition plan. So that means that knowledge management, service validation and testing, transition planning and so forth has to occur during service design as well. Transition activities have to get managed earlier so that we have a plan in place when the service comes to us for transition. Now as we start looking at the transition activities, I want to use my different process areas to coordinate how that change effectively is introduced. To be able to coordinate through change management how we request changes, how we assess them for risk and cost, how we decide what gets approved, and how we oversee build coordination and review of changes. I'm going to use service asset and configuration management to help me maintain baselines. Where am I now? Where am I now? Where am I now? And so forth so that as we're working our way from, as the service moves from development environments to test environments to production that we're able to constantly maintain accurate information about our baselines in each environment. We're going to have to use our evaluation process to ensure that we're not just focusing 
on IT change, hardware, software, and so forth, but that we're actually focusing on what's happening on the customer side as well. What needs to happen on their side to coordinate service transitions in a way that enables them to be ready to effectively use the change in the organization? Is there user training that's required? Is there documentation that's required? Are there other types of early life supports that we're going to need to support the various stakeholders in the organization who may have different needs for that service as it comes online? How the evaluation process evaluates and looks at making sure that we don't just deliver working technology, but that it actually supports the proper customer outcomes. And then down here at validation and testing, making sure that we do the appropriate process of validating and testing technical integration, operational readiness, user acceptance, and all of the other aspects of testing that make sense for that change. Last and certainly not least, we have the role of release and deployment management. And their job ultimately is to oversee packaging, build, coordinate how the testing gets done by the testing and validation teams, and then ensure the actual successful transfer, deployment, or retirement of the service, and then to provide appropriate early life support until that service reaches maturity, at which point we can go ahead and hand it over to service operations for ongoing support. So the challenge here, again, as we look at it, becomes immediately evident. I have lots of things happening at once. How are we going to coordinate across the different process areas in a way that creates a successful and facilitated service transition? Not just a change or an implementation of a new update of a piece of software or hardware, but the transition to the service and the service outcomes associated with the change, both on the IT side and the customer side. So when we consider the broad purpose, goals, and objectives of release control and validation, I want to be able to effectively manage these transition activities, to manage service changes, to manage the various assets and resources it's going to take to take these changes out of development environments through testing and validation and successfully into production in a way that allows us to manage risks and successfully deliver the benefits associated with these changes in a way that supports the appropriate environments and sets appropriate expectations, not just for the functionality of the service, but expectations for performance of the service and ensuring that the changes create the appropriate expected value. Last and certainly not least, it's very important in order to be able to effectively do that to manage appropriate knowledge transfer as information moves from service design through transition and into operations successfully. So when you consider the broad scope of service transition then, it's about being able to manage and coordinate a broad array of different things. We have seven different processes that are working. We're working across a number of different technical and functional groups, managing different systems, and ultimately have to be able to apply these across all the different aspects of the service transition. How we package up and figure out what we're going to put into particular releases of services, how we oversee the build, the test, and ultimately the release and deployment of those services, and how we make sure that the services are stable and effectively operating in the production space before we can hand them over effectively to service operations. Now, we're going to be getting service transition requests from all sides, from requests from operations, requests from continual service improvement activities, projects, chartered services coming through, and so forth. So we need to be able to effectively align and coordinate that in a way that allows us to manage resources and effectively deliver working changes. So when you consider the value to the business associated with the service transition stage of the life cycle, first and foremost, what we want to be able to do is actually to handle more change, not less. This can be a little bit counterintuitive if you think about it, because of course we're establishing processes and domains and procedures and all of these activities that we want to undertake before we introduce services into the live environment. But our goal here, of course, is to be able to do this in a consistent and repeatable way to be able to use change models and release and deployment models so we're not essentially making things up each time we have to go put services into production in a way that helps facilitate the introduction of change and overall improves productivity both on our side and our ability to both manage change and be able to reduce the number of incidents that we create and also to be able to improve the overall productivity for the customer again by reducing incidents and improving the overall quality and availability of service that they get. 
one of the things we want to be able to do is to use things like testing and validation to establish appropriate predictable quality of service so that when we look at services and service expectations that the services that we provision and deliver into production match those expectations. If we do this right, this should help us deliver a higher success rate overall in the introduction of new services and changes, allow us to both create and sustain and use consistent repeatable plans and allow us to help the organization effectively adapt to change in a way that helps hopefully deliver strategic benefit so the customer can effectively make changes and change their particular business processes based on opportunities in the marketplace and that we become part of the strategic value of that organization in being able to help enable and support adaptations.